thanks everyone for coming and thanks for coming online as well. I'd like to introduce Jana de Villiers to talk about sequential Bayesian learning. First of all, thank you for having me. I had a wonderful time the last four weeks here. This is my last day. I am already scheming how to get back here soon. So today, the, the title could have also been something data assimilation. The reason why I called it sequential Bayesian learning is because I'm personally exploring more and more the boundaries between what is classical like or considered machine learning and what I've been doing so far in data simulation. And I mean, the machine learning community also is going more and more in the direction of what I personally would call data simulation, what sometimes is called a Bayesian um, machine learning or physics informed machine learning. So in a way, I feel at least personally that the, the fields are kind of growing together and that there's not that much difference. So um, in my introductory slides, I kind, kind of going in the detour and trying to convince you of the that, and I'm open also to discuss this further. So generally, just to be all on the same page about what is uh, considered to be learning at all. Um, so when I speak of learning, I typically mean I have a bunch of data and I somehow want to make sense of it in terms of trying to understand, um, yeah, is, is there some kind of model that I could learn um, and then um, ultimately find out more about the system I have data on. And um, of course I could use, uh, you, you saw on the earlier slide, um, I could, for example, the, the first thing that always comes to mind is let's use a neural network because that worked well. Uh, in particular in um, areas like um, um, image recognition, it works very, very well, but actually in the, the application areas, I'm currently kind of doubling in. Um, it is not that straightforward. And I'm also going to discuss yeah, what, what are the reasons for this. So essentially um, in the machine learning um, setting, what are you trying to do? You essentially have, I mean, I, I know there are many variations from unsupervised and supervised. I'm not gonna go into all of these details. So this is a little bit more superficial in that sense, but let's say our goal is we have data um, that is coming from two random variables and there's a joint distribution of uh, those two random variables, X and Y. And I'm essentially, um, so I have, I have some samples from that joint distribution. And now I'm trying to make, um, to find actually the link between my two random variables. So my assumption that there is one link that one is basically um, affecting the other. And I want to kind of figure out what this uh, link is. And I will do that by approximating some kind of function H. And the first really key step is actually choosing the model class. And you could just do endless lectures just on that. And the, the beginnings of machine learning actually lived in that area when we kind of think of support vector machines, finding, finding classes that um, um, represent or have, have enough function to describe the data well, but are also somehow narrow enough. I will hint at that in another slide. And then of course you have to choose a loss function and those two choices will already highly affect um, your outcome, obviously. And then what are you trying to do is if you make these two choices, you're essentially just trying to, to calculate the expected value with respect to this joint distribution um, for, um, for your loss functional L. And, and uh, with respect to obviously this, this H, um, and you can do that for all kinds of function H that um, are in your, your, let's say capital H here, the, the room of functions you're looking in. And um, you, you're trying to go for that H that is kind of minimizing this expected value, which is often also called expected risk. Because obviously you're trying to, to have a very small loss and you can think of it as a risk in terms of predicting the wrong thing. Um, now, um, of course, in practice, um, the settings are, uh, this is just like the, the two most trivial examples you could think of uh, and uh, really fitting is actually more or less the, 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 like the left panel and the, the very right panel. The middle panel is a little bit more complicated um, because this is, I mean, you can think of it as just having three labels, but um, it's more of a k-means kind of thing where you don't really have uh, Ys and you're just trying to sort the axis. But uh, let's 
just talk about the, the uh, linear regression on the left hand side. So what you're trying to find is just the, the line and the uh, H is basically representing the line. And um, so in practice, obviously, you only have a finite number of samples, so you cannot really access the, this expected value um, analytically. Um, but what you can do is you have samples, you can calculate it empirically or at least approximate it empirically with the empirical risk. And the empirical risk, again, is heavily dependent on what your sample set might look like. It might be too small. And then if you switch it up, um, it, you immediately get a different um, best age, for example. Um, but these are all like finer points you really have to, to look into deeper if you're trying to do this right. Uh, but um, yeah, we, we're trying to like morph to data estimation. That's why I'm rushing over all of this. Um, so just one more thing to, to pinpoint that, uh, of course, uh, I was saying the, the most important um, step is actually choosing that age well. Um, and the problem, of course, is um, you don't want to underfit in terms of, for example, these, um, if you think of um, this as being the X and this as being the Y, those points cannot be well described by just a line. So if I would just be looking, um, for example, age is just uh, different lines I could uh, draw through that space. And then this would be just underfitting because I didn't choose my age large enough. Um, but then I could just go for the overkill and just choose something super complicated. And that's often happening if I choose a neural network. I go for the most complicated thing I can think of. And of course, it will be perfectly estimating the points I have, the sample data, but it might be doing really weird things in between. And um, essentially, what we're trying to go for, the ultimate goal is to do this perfect kind of um, balance between underfitting uh, and overfitting. And this is really down to choosing the, the right class here. And what's often happening is that this is not done well. And I mean, people know that you, you tend to overfit, but there's also not a great like way to, to immediately know how to choose this well to then in the end end up in this setting. I mean, there are things like VC dimension that are being used in support vector machines when they first originated. But um, yeah, for, for, um, for example, neural networks, it's much more complicated. So to, to kind of finish this whole detour, um, so what we're trying to do is somehow estimate maybe because Typically what we do is we don't just say we have this function class, we typically also say the function is somehow parameterized and what I really need to describe the whole function is just this parameter theta might be a set of parameters, but um, what we're ultimately trying to do is really find this optimal parameter to then find the, the optimal age. Um, so you, again, you do try to do this well that you somehow find a parameter that is describing you for function that is already restricting you somehow. Um, now, um, if you think um, of, the, uh, of all of this, how would you do this? You would just feed in the whole bunch of data in here and uh, you made the choices of age and uh, the, the way theta goes into it and everything else. And then you just solve an optimization problem, simple. It might be hard in terms of that the optimization problem is hard or anything in that direction. But other than that, that's it. That's all machine learning really is about. Choose your age, um, choose like choose maybe also your S and then go for it and optimize. And um, now there are actually settings where you don't just have the batch of data available. And these settings might be that for example, you, you're waiting for something that is coming into your age that you can only observe in, um, in the next time step, for example, or you, you might have some um, data security issue that you can never store all the data at one place and you can only get them sequentially coming in or something. And at this point you, you would be like, uh, okay, I want to, to actually, rather than having the whole batch of data and learning my parameter, like on the basis of all this data immediately, you want to do it sequentially. In fact, there are also numerical reasons. I mean, for example, stochastic gradient descent is all about my data is actually too large. And despite knowing that I'm actually making a mistake, if I'm not choosing all the data points at once, 
I can just numerically ease into it much easier if I do the, do the, the individual or smaller mini batches um, because uh, having such a huge data set means also that the optimization problem becomes huge and that makes everything more complicated. So you opt out for the approximation because you know in the end you might converge or you actually close to the true solution. So that's another reason why you want to maybe um, do the whole thing sequentially. So just pure numerical reasons. Another thing could be in there, we're already entering the more um, that typically the, the earliest things for machining was super successful with um, image recognition. And there's no time, there's no um, link in terms of um, time between images and um, um, their label, for example. Of course, if you, for example, had the same person aging, it's a different thing, then you kind of add a um, yeah, time element to it. That's interesting. And actually they're looking into this as well. If you can, for example, if you can recognize me as a child, can you still recognize me as an adult, for example? Um, I mean, there are interesting things going on. But uh, one thing could be that, for example, you have a time-dependent control coming in. Um, uh, so the sequential decisions are involved or your parameter itself is um, time-dependent. And um, all of these could be reason to say, okay, let's do the whole thing sequentially. Now let's just to give like the idea how to, uh, how would you do that? In some settings, if you choose your cost functional um, in a certain way, this is actually not trivial. Where it is doable is for example, in your regression. It's also obviously doable in other settings, but I'm just opting out for the easiest setting here. Even like dimension wise, just really like scalar times parameter. You can of course do it um, if this is a vector as well. Uh, but um, let's do the, the most easiest thing. So the classical, um, if that, that's just a cost functional because we choose our age, uh, it's just a, like this linear um, connection here between the X um, and the Y. And then the, the optimal parameter um, after N time step or seeing the whole batch of data that is of size N um, is just this. And what you can do then to, to make it, um, because if I have a new data point now coming in, I essentially have this, um, if I then again do it for the whole batch from scratch, um, from one to n plus one, when it comes to the data, this would be my optimal parameter. But it would be somehow nice to just use this information um, to get this and not just run the whole thing again. And what you can do is actually use um, this formula um, um, because um, essentially the, this first par part here is relating to the A then, and then you can use this. And it's still actually a little bit of messy. That's why I didn't write down all the equations because what you end up with is a fun or a weird version that you could think of actually um, as a data assimilation app of the classic Kalman update. Um, what is happening then is, uh, so you, you basically replace this term with this here. It's even very simple here because the uh, U and V are the same in my kind of setting, just because I, I chose it to, to be so simple. And um, what you then realize is that um, part of it will just be the this, this original um, previous optimal parameter for just N samples. And, and then you can see how it directly basically relates to, to having seen this new observation and using the current parameter to, to, to get to, to the what you think the Y should be, and then actually seeing the Y and then correcting for that difference essentially, which is exactly what is being done then in data assimilation. And a very similar formula, um, actually this is, this is a special case of the Woodbury formula, which is a key formula that is also being used in data assimilation. Okay, so let's say I, I convinced you that simple regression you could actually do, um, Sequentially, it's often known as recursive regression um, or even online regression. Uh, and to me, it's funny that they use completely different words because I would just call it data assimilation at this point um, or filtering. And um, um, it is actually a little bit more costly to do this, like um, or uh, like the whole thing, not the individual steps, but the whole thing. Uh, but it typically converges faster to, to the correct parameter. Now, um, having said all this, I'm trying to now do the 
to like going fully to the data estimation setting. So up to now, what we had is somehow we're trying to find the link between X and X and Y. And now we're, I'm saying I do actually know what the link is. I could I could phrase it in the data estimation setting in several ways, but now I say I know what the age is. Um, but the problem is I cannot just directly access observe my X um, anymore. Uh, but I can generate access or surrogate access somehow that are close to the truth by having uh, some kind of model. And this is exactly the setting you are in in data simulation. And since this is just a surrogate model that I'm, or there is at least some kind of uncertainty coming in, um, or um, I, I can, for example, fully um, describe the whole distribution um, that is kind of saying, okay, what do the, what's the distribution associated with the X um, look like? I can do that. But of course, if I'm trying to, for example, predict something that's happening in real life, um, it's one realization that I'm trying to predict. So there's some kind of uncertainty when I, like I, I draw a sample of X and it might not be the same sample that is happening in reality in terms of the realization that is going on. For example, I'm trying to predict the financial market or I'm trying to do data like a numerical weather prediction or something. Um, and then the goal is because I, I know I cannot get the full truth. I can say, okay, I, I either try to estimate the, the distributions associated to it. And the simplest case, I can say they're all Gaussians. And um, so that would be basically then trying to like, for example, starting off the Gaussian um, that is associated to the model um, F that is generating my axis. And then I observe a Y here. Um, um, and um, so that this X is basically going forward, like this is where I start and then I go forward in time, which is a green Gaussian. And then having seen this observation, I can narrow it down a little bit just to get the posterior. So it's basically a base step. Um, but in a way, it's heavily re related to, to the linear regression we just saw. And in that sense, um, you can also think of it as suddenly having a really good prior for your theta, actually. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But in a way, it's just saying, okay, I don't know exactly what my theta is, but I have a pretty good idea in what area it should lie, for example. And that's, for example, the, the like parts of machine learning is going the direction where they say, okay, we, we should not just assume the, the, the theta could be anything because we know there are some boundaries where it shouldn't even be or have some other kind of prior information. And the idea is to use that opposed to just say, okay, let the data speak for itself. Um, and um, yeah, so my feeling is machine learning is moving towards this direction. And this is where data submission has always been. There's always been this heavy um, reliance on already actually knowing a lot about the system, but then just having some uncertainties due to other issues. Um, but data estimation more and more relies on the computational efficiency of machine learning. So um, I hope I at least convinced you a little bit that the two are totally related um, because yeah, I think a lot of the, actually a lot of the, the future in data simulation is or are you going in that direction and saying, okay, let's at least some of the toolboxes or the, or not toolboxes, but the tools that are very successful in machine learning um, because we need to also advance our technique somehow, and that is often going in that direction. Yeah, and as I said already, the machine learning community is like the going um, themselves towards data estimation. Now, um, when you think of data estimation, the first application you typically think of is numerical weather prediction. Um, this is because, partially because the data estimation, the whole field has been heavily developed um, in the community of people who were actually doing numerical weather prediction. And they didn't really care that much necessarily about the mass, but they had to get the system to work and actually do, do the job. And, but the, the yeah, most popular techniques or a lot of what has been out there has been developed in that context. And uh, another reason why it's a very good example is because it's still so difficult that um, there's a lot of people just trying to improve the, the state of the art methods because you have you do have a really complicated, very well-informed model, but it's so complicated um, that 
just producing numerical solutions of it or actually approximations of it um, is so hard that you can, with a supercomputer, only produce 100 samples at a time, for example. And um, you do, at this point, have a lot of data, uh, so much to the point that people are arguing, let's just, just use the data, but the dynamics are so complex that you typically don't get away with that either. And uh, the dimensions are also huge. So think of 10 to the, like worst case, 10 to the power of eight. Um, so just to, I will not go deeply into them, but just to give you, of course, any time there's a model and there's some, uh, and you have data, um, as soon as you have these two informational sources, you can immediately do data simulation in some kind of form. And um, another really cool example that I'm personally also working in is actually space weather. And it seems like, okay, space weather, what's the, like, despite being called space weather, uh, physically speaking, it's actually about something completely different as in the American weather prediction, because what you're actually trying to understand are, uh, so there are belts of charged particles in the near space, um, uh, in the near Earth area. And you're trying to estimate um, essentially the phase space density of these um, because they're very important because they can be harmful to, to any human in space. Um, uh, satellites, and we heavily rely on satellites. In February of this year, for example, um, Elon Musk lost uh, 40 satellites um, to, to a solar storm like this. I mean, it was a little bit more complicated. There was a solar storm um, um, interacting with the uh, um, geomagnetic field of the Earth, um, and that's caused the, the satellites to all die. Um, but um, essentially, the, the, the cause was a solar storm. Um, so you're trying to estimate this. And nowadays, more and more numerical weather prediction centers are actually also looking into doing space weather, weather estimation just purely because of the, the satellites. Because without the satellites, they're down. You already have such a mess that you care heavily already about this. But even for us, and if there's a huge solar storm, it can actually also affect electronics on Earth. Uh, it can be really bad there. Apparently it was like one that in the um, 1800s that was so bad that if it would happen now, like would massive travel on Earth. Um, but method-wise, you can use the same methods as you're doing in numerical weather pr prediction. It's the same thing you can do. Of course, you have to always adjust to the physics, but that's essentially it. And in Potsdam, we actually do have, I think in Germany, it's the only real-time um, prediction of, for example, radiation belts. That's one of the belts uh, in the near space area that is important. Um, yeah, and I think in the US, they have several more centers of this, but in Germany, we're the only ones, I think, who have a real-time prediction. Um, the cool thing about this is in America, weather, uh, weather prediction, people have been working for like centuries, not centuries, um, decades now on fixing this. Here, you still, the models are not great and developed yet. And uh, also the data simulation is on a level where you can really do a lot of improvements. So, okay, uh, I made a lot of advertisement now for the different methods. Let's go into, down to the math. So uh, despite all of this numerically obviously happening in discrete setting, I will now jump to the continuous setting just because um, I actually want to uh, do some theory and I don't want to rely on some uh, having to prove it for all kinds of discretization. I want to show, it, uh, show some properties in the continuous case without having to discretize. So again, just as a reminder, we have the two ingredients, which are a model and some observations. And the model here in my continuous setting is given in form of an SDE. What you typically also have, and like generally you have an ODE or a PDE, but due to numerical artifacts, you, you at least can assume there's some noise due to that. Uh, but even because you, your model might not be fully reflecting reality or something. So that's why we also assume that we have some noise here. So we have an SDE. And the observations are also assumed to come in continuously. Again, one could say, okay, that's a little bit of a stretch when it comes to what is like what you would do in the discrete case. But in fact, the data stream is actually nowadays coming, coming in so frequently that uh, sometimes people have been actually thinking about even in the discrete setting, somehow 
at least um, a little bit going in that direction to just look at the deviations because the data is coming in so frequently. You often in practice don't do the update so often because it's so costly. But yeah, that's something that the data is coming in literally continuously. Um, so uh, what's the whole goal? The goal is to estimate the so-called filtering distribution, which is just a posterior distribution if you um, have a prior tied to the model and then the data comes in through a likelihood. And the, so the, the probability or the density we're trying to look at is just um, off the signal at a certain time conditioned on all the data points we have seen so far. And you do, one does actually know how this density evolves in time. So there are, there are equations for, these, for this, but the issue is you cannot numerically access the solution of the, these equations because in a high dimensional setting, yeah, just too difficult. Um, but um, it's a nice um, thing to have. We will later see how we can derive some, some filters uh, through this knowledge. Now, just a quick reminder, we did essentially what I started off with, with the linear regression. If I would switch the linear regression up to the, to, to have this um, age being known, but then trying to find the X rather than the theta, and also having a, a model F that is producing samples, um, what my uh, sequential update would actually look like um, is in the uh, discrete setting called the Kalman Busi, uh, the Kalman filter. And the continuous setting uh, basically looks very similar. Uh, the gain is a little bit different here. But here you can think of this as this, uh, which is often written as K because it's known as a Kalman gain. And here's essentially the improvement, which is also called an innovation. And what you really do in this setting is you, you just have Gaussian in that setting when everything is linear. Um, so you know your filtering distribution is a Gaussian and all you need to describe that are the first two moments. And what you see here is a time evolution of, of the first moment. And you also have an equation for the second moment. So this case is basically done. You can just compute it. You might do to, to large dimensional setting. This might be huge and you have run into numerical issues, but other than that, this is solved. Um, but the issue is, of course, the world is rarely linear, and especially the systems we're looking at. So using this kalman Busi filter in its current form is not possible. And the next best thing you can think of, uh, about again, which we already said, is essentially let's do an empirical approximation, which is generate samples, and then we somehow access this filtering distribution empirically. But I told you already that it's super difficult to generate samples from this prior. Um, just due to the system being so complicated. So you could, for example, generate um, here yeah, M, M could be equal to 100 or 200, which in 10 to the power of six, seven or eight is nothing to, to describe this. Um, um, if you could generate a lot of them for, from the prior, um, you have a lot of data, and then you could just, uh, through the likelihood, uh, compute these importance weights, and then you immediately had, would have a very good approximation of, um, of your posterior density, and then you would be done. And this is known in the community as sequential Monte Carlo or particle filter. And, um, but since you, so if, if we had a lot of samples, as I said, we would be done, but since you don't, what is happening is, um, this is true for the, the particle filters, the particle smoother, all of them, uh, what is happening is, so these are your samples from the prior, and this is your observation. And of course, all of those super far away from your observation, um, the, the weights will essentially become zero, and only those two will have a weight that is maybe a little bit uh, larger. Um, and this is just obviously a small sketch, but in high dimensions, you virtually could have sample, like all the samples would essentially have um, weights here because you could be super far away um, from the observation just due to the, the space being large. And um, you, you would have to sample or you would have to have samples all across space to always have one sample at least be closed. And then you don't just want to have one sample because you want to have many samples. Sometimes this issue is a little bit tried to like mitigate it by just saying, okay, we just throw all of those away and generate new samples around 
around those two, just copies of this and a little bit of noise. Um, but um, this is not fixing the issue um, in these dimensions. So one thing that would help is somehow to say, okay, how about we bring the samples closer to the observation and then the problem will be fixed because then they all would be somehow be well describing um, um, or somehow would be close to the observation. Then there, there would be appropriate samples uh, also to keep. And then we could do this whole empirical thing again. And in fact, the, what the Kalman filter does is exactly that. Of course, there you only have one sample really because you, you only care about the mean. But um, uh, the best algorithms out there are actually really doing that. And they're essentially using this whole idea of the moving the particles towards something. And the idea is um, similar to what we had earlier in the Kalman Busi filter. Uh, you have this innovation term, which is basically just saying how far is your current prediction that's coming from the prior. Uh, from the observation. And then you want to um, adjust your prediction that's coming from the prior with the, um, the deep, uh, difference between this. Uh, and there's this uh, common gain factor that you're trying to, to estimate um, that is bringing this term in just the, the right amount of, um, in the right of amount or in the right size, let's say that. And um, so, People, uh, so the common Busi filter essentially does that. And people were inspired by that and said, okay, uh, so we just, so what you see up for, uh, here is just the SDE from the model. And the idea was just, okay, let's add a control term that is doing exactly that. And uh, we don't know this one here, this is unknown, but we want to have the same kind of structure as in the common filter. There is actually also this extra term coming in, but in the Stratonovich formulation, you exactly have this gain times um, um, innovation. And then, uh, of course, we don't just want to go anywhere. We want the samples to, act, uh, to be samples of the true posterior. And we want to choose our gain in that exact way. And um, what we can do is then we look at the focke planck equation of this modified evolution equation, which is down here. And for these two, actually, this evolution equation to produce samples of the true posterior, we just need this equation then to be equal to the to the kushner stratonovich equation we had earlier that is basically describing the evolution of the, the filtering distribution. And this is what people did. Um, actually, there's very, many variants out on this. Um, so people said, okay, we just need to find a K that is bringing the kulbot lagner diver uh, uh, divergence between these two uh, densities that come from one from the Fokker-Planck of the modified evolution equation and one from the kushner Shotanovich. Uh, we want this to be zero. And um, you, you can find such a K. And the K is um, um, basically the solution of this weighted Poisson equation here. Now, this is actually not the only way to, to find such a gain. And uh, you, you can find many different variants of these weighted Poisson type equations. And actually there's a very cool paper out on this. Uh, so I'm just presenting to you one method of these kinds. They all follow the same idea. You want to find kind of an evolution equation for the samples. Um, and you have, um, because it's so close, uh, Sahani Patiraja has a, and collaborators has a paper out on this and she's at UNSW right now. So you should definitely have her over and talk here as well, um, where she actually connected all of these different um, types of filters that have been individually developed over the year, like last 10, 15 years. Um, but yeah, I'm just presenting one to you. And so this is the so-called partic uh, feedback particle filter. And the cool thing now is, uh, so it, just from a theoretic perspective, this is very cool to have. Now you have this modified evolution equation, which is actually producing samples from the true posterior. And you're doing exactly what you want to do. You move the particles somewhere towards the observation, um, which should be helping with the whole curse of dimensionality. Numerically speaking, you're not, you're not getting anywhere because solving a weighted Poisson equation each time step is of course not, compute, like, not great at all. 
um, especially because this also depends on the tree posterior, which you only have in terms of uh, particles. So numerically speaking, you didn't win anything. But what you can do is now say, okay, fair enough. I, because this is actually producing, if you would be able to solve this, you would immediately have the two the samples of the two posterior, as many as, as you want, which is awesome. But um, when you, you, what you're trying to do is somehow go better than the state of the art. And I will go down to what state of the art is actually already on the, on the site. But the, the idea is now you could say, okay, at least we can find some kind of approximation of this K or, or solve like approximately solve some kind of version of this voided Poisson equation. And uh, maybe we're already better than state-of-the-art filters uh, right now. Because state-of-the-art is actually saying, okay, this K is a constant gain. And um, then the, the approximation reduces to that. And this actually leads you to, to the filters that have been around for like since 1996 um, that are called ensemble Kalman filters in the discrete case and the, and the continuous case ensemble Kalman Bussi filters. And uh, they in the German net office is using a version of this. In fact, the, this version, because there's also several versions in terms of how you define the innovation, this is what you would call um, a deterministic, or it also says here, de deterministic in um, ensemble Kalman Bussi filter. Um, because there are versions where you have in this innovation term in the brackets, you actually have perturbations coming in. Um, this is a complicated detail. If you're interested, I'm happy to talk about this more, but um, just bear with me that this continuous version is actually, um, if you take the, the time limit of many of the filters that are actually being used, for example, at the numerical um, uh, weather offices, um, they they converge to this continuous version. So it's a very relevant filter to look at. And this is basically, um, first of all, the one to beat. So if you want to develop an even cooler filter, what you want to do is you want to have something more elaborate in terms of the gain than this. Hopefully, um, by having something more elaborate, you, you will at least go beyond this Gaussian assumption because what's behind this, and that's also why it's called the, because the Kalman filter here is coming in again, is essentially the underlying assumption is to say, okay, my posterior and my prior and my likelihood are Gaussians again. Um, and um, what I'm doing is instead of just looking at the first two moments, I'm empirically approximating them. And um, the cool thing that is coming in also in the um, discrete case, rather than using some kind of linearization of the drift here, you actually propagate your samples with the nonlinear function, which then of course would not, even if you start off with the Gaussian, you would never like end up with the Gaussian then anymore, but you don't care about it. You just uh, take advantage of the fact that you're propagating your samples nonlinearly and that they somehow carry some information in that, even though then at the end you just say, okay, and then we, we're assuming again that everything is a Gaussian in the next time step. To, to then propagate forward in time again uh, in terms of the, the common update. So yeah, so this has been around for a long time. It works very well. Everybody's using it, but mathematically speaking, it has actually not been um, investigated because one thing that's really like great, but also weird is it works very well in a setting where you're far from a Gaussian assumption or linear setting. And at least you, you cannot expect at all for it to be um, reproducing the true posterior. But what you want to know is how well am I doing in terms of signal tracking ability? Because um, it seems to what we see in the, like just in the uh, in applications, is it works very well, but can you actually derive some bounds on it? And um, for the last 10 years, people have been looking into it in the discrete setting and um, also in the continuous setting. Um, and we looked at it as well. And we're actually able to derive for these types of filters. We're kind of the first to derive some bounds for this more general setting where you actually um, in the, the nonlinear case. There are some people who are even still concerned with the, the linear setting because even there, not everything is worked out. Um, and let me quickly check to move on a little bit. So there are many details involved in how to derive bounds. Um, first step, just really quick, is 
to actually make these filters work in practice, what you do is um, something that is called localization, which essentially means because you have an empirical approximation here of your covariance metrics, which of course is very bad because you have like very few samples and your dimension is very large. So you kind of need to, this is very like ill-conditioned uh, Ill and has is far from full rank. So you somehow trying to at least fix it a little bit. Um, part of the idea is to, because you could even have spurious correlations like popping up, suddenly telling you that the weather in Berlin is highly related to what's going on in Lisbon, which uh, at least on some levels when it comes for, to factors such as rain shouldn't be the case. And then you want to set those correlations to zero. That's essentially happening here. You, you setting stuff to zero. And we also use this um, for, our, for our proof uh, as a tool. Um, so there are many other assumptions. So there's no free lunch. We, have, we looked at this for the, the general nonlinear case, but um, still had to make um, some concessions to, to, do, to be able to drive uh, anything at all. Um, so one thing that is actually not a strong assumption to say, that you somehow have short range interactions, um, which means essentially you're, you have a huge dimensional state space, so many grid cells, but um, the range of interaction is also basically the length of uh, the size of that grid cell or just a few beyond that, um, which makes sense if you have just a huge area you're covering. As soon as you go down to the microscopic level, and that's the reason why you suddenly have so many grid cells, then this is not true anymore. Then another thing that, just to show you what's happening if you're not assuming this. So this is the, the typical toy ground you play around with um, in data simulation, uh, the Lorentz 63, because on, on three dimension already everything that could go wrong can go wrong uh, because it's very chaotic. And what you see here is the blue is the, the true, the reference solution we're trying to estimate. And uh, the purple is what you get with the data simulation. Uh, just with a simple EN cap or something. And um, in the first panel on the left, you, you observe the first component. And in the uh, second panel on the right, we observe only the third component. And for this system, it's very well known that uh, if you observe the, the third component, it doesn't give you enough of, uh, um, information to then track the signal appropriately. Um, depending on which system uh, you're looking at, people understand that very well what you need to observe and especially people like Edris Titi actually uh, spent um, yeah, have many many papers out for many different systems exploring exactly this question but um, um, here we know okay we've got to be careful and since we are assuming a general system we said okay we assume we observe everything which is a very strong assumption because typically that what you, is not what you do, but at least uh, we just do still assume that the observations are noisy. Um, yeah, and with, this, uh, with these assumptions, what you can then do is you can find bounds on your covariance metrics. And these bounds depend on the accuracy of the, of the, the observation essentially. And all you're trying to do there is to ensure that you're not blowing up in terms of the samples, that your samples are going all over the place, which is basically what you see right here, or that you're collapsing, going down to zero, where you only have one meaningful sample. And uh, having these bounds basically tells you neither of these things are happening because you have an upper and lower bound. And as soon as you have that, you can actually look into signal tracking ability. And this is basically the signal tracking error here. And we're um, able for fixed T, so fixed time step, to find a bound here and also uniform in time, so for, for a fixed time interval. And um, the only thing that still comes in and you've got to be honest about is it, the bound does depend obviously on the state of the, um, of the dimension of the state space, which again is not great because that can be huge. Uh, but one thing that is good is if you look at the individual components, what you can show then is that the error in the individual components does not depend at all on the dimension of the state space, which uh, is then good because it just means that the error is equally distributed across space. And um, we also, of course, like we, this is a lengthy proof, but you can also numerically verify um, these, um, 
the bounds we were able to arrive theoretically. And just to, to finish off this topic, um, we, no, 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 but we need the localization and some other like fixes to, essentially you need the localization to fix it. Um, in the earlier paper we had, we assumed that the number of ensemble members is at least um, larger than the dimension of the state space, which is not infinite, but basically la so large that you could not, is, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It doesn't. In the original proof that I did with Sebastian and Wilhelm, since we're going by the Frobenius norm, it does actually uh, scale with the number of particles as well. Uh, but in this proof, uh, it, we're going a different route. I mean, we can discuss the details later, but it doesn't depend on the size of the, the M, which is also nice, yeah. In the first round of proofs, we, we, we had still this dependency. So essentially, although this was basically the first proof of its kind or the first bound of its kind in that kind of particular area of these methods, uh, what we're trying to do now is, of course, make the, the assumptions a little bit more reasonable when it comes to the, uh, uh, the actual applications. One of the really crucial assumptions we make is that we observe everything. I showed you already what can go bad if you don't assume this. Um, but what you can do is say, okay, I am assuming a certain type of system I'm looking at. And as soon as you do that, you can leverage the properties of that system and don't need to make such general assumptions anymore. Of course, then you still need to ensure that you're observing the right things. But um, yeah, you can, you can use the properties of the system uh, rather than just generally saying, okay, just to be sure we observe everything. Because you don't often need to observe everything. It is enough to, to observe the right things, but what are the right things are that's changing from system to system. So that's one alley we're working on right now. And the other thing you can do, that's going again a little bit in the machine learning setting. So in a way having saying, okay, observe everything is kind of overkill. You're observing too much. They have too much, like the batch of data is too large. And of course what they do in machine learning, then they say, okay, let's just take a few of them and we, we randomly sample what we, what we take in terms of the data. And then approximately we're, trying, we're, we're getting where we want to get to as well. And that's another alley we're currently exploring uh, where basically the age, um, what you observe is randomly selected. And the only uh, thing that you need to ensure is that you're coming back to that particular component and observe it frequently enough in your um yeah and uh, your random like generating process that is generating which component is observed in each time step basically uh, which you can think of it as like so it's uh, the term that is being used often is subsampling and this is a popular thing to do all over the place and um, we think it's also good here where you can then in the end still say that you at least converge to these kind of bounds um, or get similar type of bounds, um, even though you're not observing everything and you don't have any particular assumptions on the system. Yeah, so this is just uh, what we've been up to also, because I introduced this whole thing. Um, this was the constant looking into how the filter is doing in the constant gain approximation. So the state of the art filters, but of course, um, if you were trying to develop the algorithms a little bit better, the next question is actually looking into going beyond this very, um, simple approximation here. And the, if you go just one order up from constant gain, the hope is you would immediately get an improvement already over the, these uh, Gaussian approximative filters. Um, you will have to deal with a lot of numerical instability already because even just approximation this would be hard. But I, when I first saw it, I thought this is very cool that this allows this. And one thing that I personally also find interesting, no matter what kind of parameterization you use here to approximate the, the gain, what you can then try to understand, if you go up in the, the order of the uh, parameterization approximation or the approximation with this um, specific parameterization, what you can understand is how well are you actually doing in terms of improving accuracy uh, versus um, 
computational efficient, like how much extra computational time you have to add to actually get this. This is an interesting question because a lot of people, despite maybe not going this route, are trying to go beyond the Gaussian approximation, uh, but always hitting the wall when it comes to the computational feasibility. So that's like where a lot of the things are heading. And I wanted to talk a little bit also about sequential decision making, which you can have as another add on, but I kind of ran out of time here now, but I guess that I will do that next time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you so much. No, anyway, use is spoken use delivery. This does not seem very physical to me because you like if you have a history in you know, our setting, then the observations are all they are all uncorrelated, you know, and if that makes sense because there's sufficient time there for those small scale problems to set away the observations are all there. They're not there. But if you got a few limited, you would expect the observation are all uncorrelated. And that's the goal there. So is there is there a way of making you continue to you know, not considering that, you know, it's unrelated to the but maybe some kind of, you know, other sort of process? Yeah, actually, because uh, here you do assume everything is uncorrelated, I think, also in the thing, like setting all of this up. But Sebastian has, I don't know if they actually already have a paper out on this, has been looking into correlated noise also for, I think, just first for the, the constant gain case. But uh, I think they have him and uh, Nick Nuskin have a paper out on it. Um, so, and it is definitely an interesting question to ask. So, you're yeah, definitely assuming that nothing is correlated in that sense, it's not very realistic. But then, in a way, I mean, okay, that's, I guess, a general problem of the filtering setting. But also, if you look at the, at least if you look at the, sorry, where's the Kushner Stratonovich equation? The structure of this modified evolution equation does make a lot of sense because you do have essentially the, the innovation coming in somewhere here as well. So it does have kind of this structure. I mean, this is due to the, the way already the, the problem is phrased. So in that sense, how it's phrased, it makes total sense that you have this modified evolution equation. In the sense, does it even make sense in reality and application? That's a different question, and you're absolutely right. And yeah, so but, but I think Sebastian even has a project on it with the other CRC where they want to look deeper into it. So, you, you said at the beginning, you said there are advantages for the situation, you know, the, the, the... Mm -hmm. so when you do like something like the regression, you think so far, yeah, how much you assume the model, yeah. Whereas when you do more power and setting or you know, you assume the conservation of power. There's another um, advantage for the way eventually also that you deal with a lot of the data, but it's a lot of sort of noise as a whole. And then you do the cost of observations, and that's kind of how it's simulated. But then you have this um, example where you express. Yeah. That, um, yeah. It's a very good question because when I try to make the connection, I kind of debate whether I should have, because if I assume the age, for example, is this, where do I put the not like, because I assume there is some kind of, if I say, okay, there's no noise whatsoever, then uh, you should always perfectly be able to, to match the Y's mm -hmm. to some I don't have a model error, but I assume observation error. But when I did this, when I made the slide, I kind of thought about if this is actually from the community thinking, if you come from the machine learning setting, I think you might have to actually put it in here in a way uh, because you would assume like, because it is often assumed that the, the Y is not, there's no measurement or error. One thing you could do is then plug it into the H somehow. If you could make it, but I did actually think about, yeah, should I put it here and here? I mean. In a way, I mean, obviously everybody in the machine learning world also knows that the, there's some error in the observations. And the, the problem often is, and this whole overfitting actually comes from the methods being built under the assumption that you can do it perfectly, I think. And that's the causing all of this overfitting. And uh, that's why people are also going more and more away from it. I mean, there's even like in neural networks where you add a little bit of random noise to some of your weights just to ensure that you're not overfitting, for example. And there, in a way, you're artificially creating noise in your model in some sense. Because I think it deals better with the fact that your model is noisy than just because of the way the optimization schemes are built, 
they always build to overfit to even the noisy data. And in a way, yeah, you're right. We can, in the sequential fashion, we could, uh, but then you have to go beyond, like you have to actually, because just doing it sequentially will not fix this problem because you would still just overfit in some sense here, even if you arrive at it sequentially. But then if you introduce this whole thinking of actually having like a prior that is not certain, because one thing you could do is I could assume you have the parameter theta, for example, and that's not certain. And then kind of updating this prior you have on the on the theta, and then you would still have uncertainty, for example, and what the theta actually is. Uh, it would become may maybe more narrow and narrow, but you would still assume that there is some kind of uncertainty. And that is going, I think, in the direction that Bayesian machine learning is going into, but that's for me data simulation. As soon as you do, like, say, okay, you have I have a prior on the the theta, and I'm slowly updating the prior rather than just updating the theta. So you work a lot more in machine learning than I do. This is, I guess, the thrust of my question because I'm asking about an area of technology. So when we talk about ensembles or approaches in the end, either like the current puts a start and you've got a bunch of samples and you're approximating over the mean theory to something else and you're using your ensemble. Or like you put up there, you say each each sample is really like a sample and I think if it's distribution is like a delta function and I know that it might not count. Yeah. Which is it does one perspective map more deeply to machine learning and which one? That's a very good question. I think it doesn't matter because you already have, obviously, for example, with the, the whole risk, this is already just very generally without, a, that's just an empirical kind of thing where you don't really assume anything, for example, for the joint distribution in terms of it being Gaussian or in any way specific. So in that sense, maybe more the more general case. But then if you actually say, okay, I assume something for the theta, I guess what people would do is start off with the Gaussian and then you're more closely related to, to the Gaussian approximation because why would you go crazy and do something more elaborate than that? It wouldn't make sense to say, okay, I think it's in this area, let's put just a Gaussian around where I assume the, the true value should be or something. But that's more of a practical matter. Thanks. Right, well, I think that's my <laughs>